with the America Europe Fund, uh, the America Europe Fund at the KU Leuven in Belgium. Uh, it's my um, great pleasure to uh, welcome you to the lecture multilateral promotion of human rights and democracy by the EU and the US. What's next? Actually, it's a panel debate uh, that we have organized for you um, this evening. And I'm very happy that we have actually two uh, high level speakers with us um, who can actually bring much closer to us the respective perspectives of the EU and the US in the context of multilateral human rights and democracy promotion. Uh, on the one hand, we have with us um, tonight, uh, Mrs. Luisa Rager. Uh, welcome, Mrs. Luisa Rager from the European External Action Service uh, in the European Union. Um, Mrs. Luisa Rager is actually holding a degree in political science and international relations from the University of Trieste and a master degree from the College of Europe. And uh, prior um, to her um, current function um, as head of the Human Rights Division of the European External Action Service, uh, Mrs. Rager has been working uh, in the EU delegation to the United States as head of section for transport, energy and environment. And then afterwards, she served as deputy head of the EU delegation to Thailand. Um, Mrs. Rager, as I said before, is now the head of the Human Rights Division of the European External Action Service. Good evening, Mrs. Rager, and we're very happy to, to have you on this panel debate. Um, uh, if I may say so, to to um, bring closer the European perspective, the EU's perspective, in the context of human rights and democracy promotion. On the other hand, uh, we have Mr. Ted Picona with us, um, who is a non-resident uh, senior fellow in the foreign policy program at Brookings and the chief engagement officer at the World Justice Project, an independent nonprofit organization dedicated to the strengthening of the rule of law. And as you can see in the background of Mr. Ted Picona, he has been working uh, again, I should say, on the rule of law index, which has just been um, uh, published um, a week ago, um, the rule of law index 2021, uh, which I'm sure he will also mention in his uh, intervention when actually uh, bringing closer to us the US perspective on human rights and democracy promotion and multilateral um, organizations and fora. Mr. Um, Picona was amongst uh, many other um, tasks and, and functions, a senior foreign policy advisor at the State Department, the National Security Council and the Pentagon and holds um, honor degrees from Columbia University's Law School and the University of Pennsylvania. Good evening and thank you for joining the panel, um, Ted Picon. Um, it's great also to see uh, so many uh, participants um, from uh, universities, from think tanks, from European institutions, from US um, um, organizations here in the context of our webinar. So welcome to all of you who are tuning in. This transatlantic dialogue focuses, um, as you know, on the EU's and US positioning and action towards human rights and democracy and multilateral fora. Um, and we will discuss the challenges that both the US and the EU have in the context of exactly that, the human rights and democracy promotion, um, but also the efforts that they are undergoing to actually come closer, to move closer towards each other, if we may say it that way, after the change in the um, administration um, in Washington DC last year. We should also perhaps uh, contextualize a little bit our session today by mentioning that actually we have um, uh, since the summer, uh, a couple of really interesting um, human rights um, and UN Human Rights Council uh, sessions behind us, not only the 
uh, if I may say, um, uh, turbulent polarizing 47th session before the summer, we had a special session on Afghanistan. And just last week, um, there was the 48th session uh, that uh, came to a close in Geneva. Uh, while at the same time um, last week, the United States was voted into um, the United uh, Nations Human Rights Council again, um, joining as a full member from 2022 onwards. Um, and that is, of course, an interesting um, uh, fact uh, that we may want to take into account. I have talked uh, way too long now as a matter of introduction, so I will and do the following. I will give immediately the floor to Mrs. Luisa Rager to introduce to us the very complex nature of um, human rights and democracy promotion from a European perspective. And afterwards, Atat Picona will do so uh, from respectively the US perspective. Um, I would like to mention that everybody has the chance to participate in this webinar by raising questions in the Q&A um, section that you find on the bottom of your Zoom toolbox. And we are happy to actually, after the two interventions by our key speakers, um, get back to you and answer all questions um, that we receive. Mrs. Luisa Rager, I would like to give you the floor. Thank you very much, Professor Raube, and thank you for the introduction. Um, I would like to cover uh, three issues uh, in my introductory remarks. First of all, the EU position on multilateralism in general, then how we work in the UN multilateral framework on human rights and democracy. And uh, the third leg of my presentation will be on the EU-US cooperation on human rights and democracy. As regards uh, the general approach to multilateralism, let me underscore that uh, multilateralism is for the EU uh, the core of uh, our foreign policy. And we have reaffirmed that in the recent communication uh, uh, titled Strengthening the Youth Contribution to the Rules-Based Multilateralism, which was adopted in February 2021. It is important to put that in, into a context. First of all, we are seeing around the world a uh, increase uh, uh, in geopolitical ri rivalries, uh, which uh, uh, also bring with that uh, greater challenges for peace and security, but also greater challenges uh, for uh, uh, the situation on human rights and democracy. And the second uh, context uh, uh, to keep in mind is, uh, and from which we all, all have learned, uh, is uh, the lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, uh, during which we have uh, been confronted with the increase in uh, inequalities, uh, uh, strain on, uh, on the human rights, uh, uh, back, backsliding of democracy. But from that, we've also learned that there is a need for collective action. Global challenges require uh, a global response, and a global response has to be based on uh, uh, multilateral uh, rules-based cooperation. Now, uh, the EU uh, main uh, goal on multilateralism is to promote global peace and security, to defend the fundamental rights, to defend the universal values and international law. Where we come from, we come with uh, some uh, clear strengths in this game, which is the EU's ability to collectively uh, portray values and project values and human rights democracy and the rule of law, when I say collectively, is 27 of us, and also with our strong convening power and ability to act as an honest broker in the multilateral setting. And uh, uh, we are uh, seen as uh, uh, a leader in uh, many multilateral organizations, and this leadership is backed by uh, the facts, and the facts are not only our participation, but also our contribution uh, uh, in the multilateral system. And I'm talking really about financial contribution as well. One quarter of the UN regular and peacekeeping budget comes from EU member states and 30% uh, of the funding, both core funding and voluntary of all development, peace building and humanitarian activities come from the UN and the member states. 
In terms of the general approach in uh, our handling of multilateral relations, we have uh, for many years uh, uh, really heavily um, uh, worked uh, uh, counting on the support of the like-minded partners uh, to pursue our priorities in the multilateral framework. But time, time has shown that this cannot be taken for granted. Uh, we are therefore looking at uh, revising our approach on one side, uh, reinforcing our traditional partnership, the partnership with the United States, of course, being uh, top of our list, but also uh, working uh, on an issue-based cooperation with uh, uh, partners that might not be our traditional partners, but with whom we share a common interest, a common objective, and we need to, to uh, develop uh, uh, ad hoc partnership. And we have uh, uh, done that in the past on specific country situation or thematic issues in the multilateral setting. Now, let me uh, now cover my second uh, uh, line, which is how the EU works uh, in the UN Human Rights Forum. First of all, our multilateral agenda is pursued in the Human Rights Council, to which you referred in your uh, introduction, but also in the uh, ANGA Third Committee in the OSC and in the Council of Europe. And we are also strong supporter of the International Criminal Court. Um, I will focus mainly on uh, the UN uh, um, Anger Third Committee and the Human Rights Council, which are uh, the primary uh, um, worldwide uh, instances where we uh, push forward uh, uh, the upholding of uh, human rights and the promotion of democracy. Uh, the way we structure our, our activities, first of all, at the beginning of each year, the European Union uh, uh, determines its priority through council conclusions adopted by, by the foreign ministers, uh, which are very detailed and include uh, uh, both thematic and uh, geographic priority. This is a strategic document, it's a yearly important strategic document, which reinforces one of the key core principles of our action, which is that the EU must deliver as one to succeed as one. For that reason, we come together up front to determine what our priorities should be. When I talk about thematic priorities, uh, uh, is uh, human rights and the environment, fighting discrimination, promoting gender equality, freedom of religion or belief, eradicating torture or death penalty, and country situations uh, that require the attention uh, of uh, uh, the Human Rights Council or the attention of the third committee lately. We have been uh, uh, focusing very much on the situation in Belarus, in Myanmar, in Ethiopia, Tigray, uh, in the Autonomous Republic of, of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol, but also in the OPT in Israel, and, uh, uh, and the list uh, continues, it's very long. Uh, the EU is, uh, as I said, seen much more, uh, uh, now than, than more now than ever as having a leading role in the UN to uphold human rights norms and principles, uh, and also to, ad to address the grave human rights situations uh, uh, in the world. And uh, this is uh, to a certain extent due to the fact that uh, the US had taken a step back uh, with the previous administration, and therefore there was a space to be uh, occupied. And uh, civil society in particular, but also a lot of our partner countries have been look, turning to us to, uh, to um, look for our leadership in maintaining uh, uh, really the center of uh, the activity in the multilateral setting on human rights and democracy. Now, uh, this is also, again, uh, uh, backed by facts uh, and uh, I can just enumerate a number of issues that on which we have taken uh, uh, quite a strong stance in the past uh, uh, year or so. First of all, uh, on Belarus, uh, uh, the EU and the member states have called uh, for an urgent debate on the situation in Belarus in the wake of the elections uh, in August 2020, and then tabled a resolution that created a strong accountability mechanism for human rights violation in Belarus. Uh, right after Tigray, Ethiopia, 
the EU resolution uh, in the Human Rights Council created a mandate for the High Commissioner to report to the Council on the situation in uh, Tigray. That was also a uh, very ambitious and timely resolution uh, that was proposed and uh, uh, very successfully adopted. On Myanmar, uh, we have, uh, before the coup and for many years, uh, uh, we have been active and promoting uh, uh, upholding human rights principles in Myanmar. And we have uh, uh, tabled the resolutions both in New York and in Geneva. Uh, the, uh, we responded then to the coup d'etat in February with a EU-led resolution and also calling with a to, on a, a special session together with the UK uh, in Geneva. The latest of this series of, of action is on Afghanistan, of course, where the events uh, uh, took place uh, during the months of, of, of August. And uh, uh, the special session, uh, uh, in our view, ended with uh, a, uh, um, it was good that it was organized, but uh, the end result was not strong enough. Uh, and therefore, uh, for the 48th Human Rights Council, uh, uh, it was decided to take two initiatives. First, uh, a EU led, uh, um, uh, Italy led uh, joint statement to which all European Union member states subscribed, uh, and then a strong resolution that created the mandate for a special rapporteur. So this is uh, uh, to summarize, uh, or to give a, a snapshot of, uh, of the activities of the European Union and, and an idea of how we, uh, we proceed. But I would also like to mention the challenges that we see, which is the second part of your question. First of all, uh, uh, the UN Human Rights Pillar is uh, uh, really underfunded. And this is a, a, a serious concern of ours. So the human rights received a tiny part of the UN regular budget, which corresponds to 3.3% of the UN regular budget, uh, which implies that it, it uh, relies very heavily on voluntary contribution to finance as much as 20% of the mandated activities. And then I would also like to give you figures on uh, the EU contribution to the, the tiny budget, which is uh, uh, EU member states together represent 50% of the voluntary contribution and 30% of the total funding of the OHCHR. So we continue this call for all countries uh, to, uh, in the fifth committee in New York, to really make an effort to give enough uh, support to the human rights uh, uh, leg of the UN. The second challenge is, of course, the difficult composition of the Human Rights Council. Uh, with, uh, we have now in the membership of the Council, we have China, Russia, Venezuela, Cuba. In 2022, we will have Eritrea as well. So it is not a very uh, favorable composition uh, when you look at voting for a, a resolution. Uh, this composition has also uh, brought to uh, many more uh, um, challenges on the univers universality and indivisibility of human rights. And there are uh, new attempts every time uh, there are discussions in Geneva and in New York to create new languages that have the uh, effect of weakening uh, the, uh, the principles of human rights. And uh, uh, the last challenge to which you have already referred is the increased confrontation. So what, what we have seen very much in the 27th session, the 47th session, and again, the 48th session is uh, uh, increase in hostile amendments, in counter resolutions, uh, in uh, uh, the stance of uh, uh, the like-minded group uh, on the principle of non-interference, uh, and for the first time, uh, the one resolution has failed to pass, has been voted down. And this is the first time in the history of the Human Rights Council that can only be uh, explained by the different dynamics that we now have in the Human Rights Council. Let me turn now to the last part of, uh, of my intervention, which is EU-US cooperation. There again, uh, I want to refer to one piece of policy document, which is the new EU-US Agenda for Global uh, Change, which was adopted in June. 
And one of the guiding principles of this the new agenda uh, is that the transatlantic partnership uh, provides a solid basis for stronger multilateral action and institutions. So this was uh, uh, one of the key messages that we wanted to pass uh, when the agenda uh, was adopted in June. Uh, we have uh, uh, seen uh, uh, big changes and immediate changes uh, with the change of administration immediately after the election, before uh, uh, the, the signs were already there and uh, uh, with the new administration were uh, confirmed, first of all, the uh, administration abandoned the Secretary uh, Pompeo's doctrine on, of inalienable rights. Uh, which was an issue of great concern to us, renewed its commitment to multilateralism, first by joining, uh, rejoining uh, uh, the Paris Agreement on climate change, and then uh, reconfirming uh, uh, that it would remain in WHO, and uh, uh, of course, on the declaration of intention immediately to rejoin the HRC, that has now materialized uh, with the elections last week, and we are really very pleased with that. And, uh, and of course, a number of important policy announcements that were made uh, uh, within a week from, uh, uh, from taking on uh, 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 the power. And I would like to mention too, uh, the executive order on the protection on LGBTI rights and the revocation of the Mexico policy on abortion. These two uh, change of policy, a complete U-turn really made us uh, coming much, much uh, closer and, and speaking with one voice in, uh, uh, in multilateral settings. Close cooperation uh, uh, between us and the US now takes place uh, ahead and during the sessions of the Human Rights Council and the Third Committee. The example of Afghanistan is a very good example where uh, uh, the US uh, joined the EU led, the Italy led EU support, EU uh, co signed uh, joint statement on Afghanistan at the beginning of the 48th session and also co sponsored the, the Afghanistan uh, resolution. Uh, gender language has always been a battleground uh, uh, in previous years, particularly in New York. And I have to say that now with the uh, complete U-turn of the policy of the US, we have a strong ally in defending uh, uh, the uh, values of uh, gender equality, of women empowerment and on diversity. So we are uh, uh, really uh, glad about that. A word on the Summit for Democracy. Uh, that, uh, of course, was a, a, is a U.S. announcement, so I'm not going to take uh, much uh, space in that. I'll leave uh, uh, Mr. Picone to cover that, uh, uh, but it was a very welcome announcement, and we have uh, uh, committed to work closely together in, uh, um, in uh, defining the concrete actions uh, to defend uh, the three strands of the summit, so universality of human rights, uh, preventing democracy from backsliding, and uh, uh, the uh, fight against corruption. Uh, in conclusion, I would just like to reaffirm that uh, you and US are uh, uh, really close partners uh, in this battle of maintaining human, the flag of human rights, the flag of democracy, and in promoting it in multilateral setting. But we also have to take into account uh, the risk of polarization in the Human Rights Council in the Third Committee, uh, which uh, are two instances that have become more and more confrontational, as I said. Uh, and ultimately, my view and our view is that we should all work for one uh, objective, not us, me, us and the US, but all the members of the institution, which is uh, to reinforce the institution and to reinforce in particular the uh, preventive role of uh, the UN human rights institution. This is a delicate balance, uh, but it's a balance that we should find and, uh, and uh, that would serve uh, the purpose of uh, uh, having stronger institutions out there. Thank you very much. And uh, this concludes my introduction. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Rager, for your introduction. And um, I think it was a really 
interesting overview and also um, uh, insight uh, into some of the latest developments um, that, that you mentioned, um, not only uh, where the EU is coming from and why the EU um, uh, is uh, still thinking of itself um, and promoting uh, human rights uh, and democracy as one of uh, the main actors in the international uh, community, um, uh, always looking for like-minded partners, uh, focusing especially on uh, the third committee, the Council um, uh, of Human Rights, but also on the, on the European uh, settings that you didn't go into too much, but that you mentioned the Council of Europe, uh, but also the OECE, but then also the challenges uh, that the EU faces. And uh, these challenges that the EU faces are challenges that um, also the United States are facing uh, in uh, that regard, the cooperation between the EU and the US becomes ever more important uh, from their respective perspectives. And I'm really interested to see now uh, what um, Mr. Ted Picone uh, will add uh, from, uh, let's put it that way, the US perspective, uh, even though, of course, you are not speaking on behalf uh, of uh, the US administration. Uh, Ted Picone, your, your floor. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And it's a real honor to join the panel with Ms. Rager and to follow up on her very comprehensive comments and try to build on them um, because I think she covered a lot of really important points and, and fundamental ground. Um, let me start by talking a little bit about the Biden administration approach to multilateralism and the important changes that we're already seeing. You know, it's only nine months into the Biden administration's. And on top of that, it's been a slow start in the sense that many, many senior appointments have not been filled yet. And so they're working uh, in a sense with a, a, a weak bench. And of course you have many good diplomats who continue on, but at the senior political level, there are a lot of empty seats. Um, so I, I'll talk about the multilateral record, um, talk a bit about the, the Human Rights Council and some of the activities and challenges there, and then some words about the, the democracy agenda. Um, so, I, you know, Ms. Varga has already mentioned several uh, examples of the dramatic change we've seen uh, when it comes to uh, kind of reviving some form of U.S. leadership on the world stage through multilateral channels. So we had, of course, you all know, four years of a very antagonistic and isolationist approach to international cooperation. So there's a lot of damage to repair. There are unpaid bills to meet, and there are relationships and promises that need to be fulfilled. So just to tick off several examples in addition to the ones you've already heard that are just a very quick reversal of the unilateral America first approach of the Trump administration. So the Paris Climate Accord uh, with John Kerry at the top of, of the uh, effort there. Um, there's a global biodiversity uh, negotiation framework and, and the United States is now aligned with the goal of protecting 30% of the world's land and ocean by 2030. Of course, rejoining the World Health Organization, but also committing up to $4 billion to funding COVID vaccine distribution uh, in COVAX. We know we're all terribly behind in getting that distributed, but I think now it's beginning to have some traction. Supporting the UN Population Fund, um, returning to the Human Rights Council, I'll say more about that. Lifting sanctions on the International Criminal Court. Uh, if you remember um, John Bolton's attack on the court is now um, ended. Uh, we have a very good career diplomat, Linda Thomas Greenfield, as our U.S. ambassador to the U.N., and she has been elevated to cabinet status. And she and Secretary Blinken have assembled already a very good, very good team. Um, and even outside the some of these traditional um, peace and human rights channels and environment, we see an effort to renew multilateral channels on Iran and containing its nuclear capacity, 
And even with Russia, you know, a deal for a five-year extension of the new START arms control agreement. So uh, definitely a change um, in, in the approach. Now, I wanted to also mention, of course, nothing like this happens in a vacuum. Uh, we have strong US public opinion on a number of these matters. And, and the good news is that the US public continues to support re-engaging with the UN and, and supports the work that the UN carries out around the world. And this is largely uh, strongly held across the political spectrum. So even though we're so divided, left and right in the United States, um, there's two thirds support for, for, for this approach and for the Congress continuing to fund the UN's work. So there's a constituency uh, that, that matters. Um, and in fact, in the Congress, if you think about the Trump efforts to dramatically cut US funding to the UN and other international agencies, um, this failed in the Congress. Um, However, the U.S. did fall into significant debt uh, uh, regarding U.N. peacekeeping dues. This is a, a continuing point of contention. But already there are steps to um, return uh, our payments um, to cover our arrears um, with a $300 million down payment. I think Congress will, will go along with that. And, and, you know, Congress did change hands. We, Democratic hands, and uh, I expect there'll be more uh, U.S. funding to international agencies and fewer conditions attached uh, to that funding. So let me turn to overall a positive um, first nine months on the multilateral front. So on the Human Rights Council, since that is the premier international body for, for human rights, um, you know, there are ongoing controversies about about the body. And it's become increasingly polarized uh, in Washington and politicized. You have critics that claim the body is hopeless, that because of its membership with authoritarian regimes like China and Cuba and Venezuela, that these regimes, we don't want to be in company with them. And uh, this is you know, a fatal flaw. Um, so people point to item seven uh, as by against Israel. Um, this is a standing item that scrutinizes Israel's human rights record at every Human Rights Council session. It's the only country that's treated this way. And there are many on both sides of the aisle who would like to see that changed without walking away from or ignoring the problems between Israel and occupied Palestinian territories. Um, but without the, 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 the sense of prejudice that uh, weighs it down. I'd be interested in hearing how Ms. Roger uh, looks at that issue. So the, the membership, the Israel issue, these are prominent concerns in Washington. So the question is how best to address them. And, and I and many others have long argued that withdrawing from the council, walking away and hoping it'll just go away is not obviously not the right approach. And, and you know, we've done studies that look at what happens when the U.S. walks away. Uh, under the Bush administration, which also left the council, Israel actually faced more condemnation, not, not less. So when the Obama administration returned to the council, it fought really hard uh, with a very proactive approach to build cross-regional coalitions and really try to take meaningful action on both country crises and thematic priorities, and got involved in trying to improve membership by recruiting uh, candidates to run and to run on competitive slates. Um, so I think during that period, I, concrete progress was made. There were new country mandates on Iran, on Burundi, on Syria, um, important thematic mandates on sexual orientation and gender identity, uh, a, a, a kind of consensus on the tension between religious freedom and counterterrorism. So these were all uh, steps in the right direction. Then you had Ambassador Haley and Secretary Pompeo come in. They made some half-hearted attempts to get support for reform. 
and then gave up and walked away in a, in a, in a tantrum. And, and what happened after that, uh, the world changes, China is in a different place and it left space for China and other authoritarian states to wield greater influence uh, to weaken the body. And this is precisely what is happening. And I've done some studies documenting how China is using its increased influence in the world to try to undermine and weaken the core human rights principles and mechanisms. Um, and they're also, of course, ramping up their attacks on countries like the US, Canada, Australia, uh, for its own human rights problems. Um, China has become more proactive in using initiatives like the Belt and Road Initiative and other trade and investment and debt relations to influence states to defend China's human rights record. Um, we've also seen it play out in vaccine diplomacy where they played off, you know, if you support or don't support an anti-China resolution or statement at the UN, um, we won't send you our vaccines. Uh, there's a reported example of Ukraine in that case. Now, what's happened at the most recent session is really interesting because China continued to move on offense at the last session, um, including pressuring some of the weaker states in Africa, but it mostly lost. Um, it pushed a resolution on the negative impacts of colonialism and it faced several hostile amendments, including two important ones that called out persecution on ethnic grounds as a potential crime against humanity. Obviously, this was a veiled reference to China's treatment of its Uyghur population in, in Xinjiang. And both of those amendments passed, close votes, but they pass. So I think that was a really important signal that, you know, drawing a line that China doesn't have a free pass on these efforts to weaken uh, these principles. And interestingly, China then withdrew a second resolution, uh, which he called realizing a better life for everyone, uh, which most of us saw as an attempt to further dilute the, the core work of the council. Now, both the European Union and and the UK played key roles in pushing back against China. And I think there's this general kind of closing ranks with the United States and other countries on holding the line against China's attempts to weaken uh, UN human rights standards and mechanisms. And this, this is part of a larger strategy of uh, checking China's rise. So it's encouraging the U.S. is um, now a member. When we say they were elected to the body, uh, we have to be clear that there was no competition in any of the regional slates, which is, I think, a shame. I think there should be competition in every region, every election. Um, so that's a, one of the weaknesses of, of the council. Um, but there, there's a larger dilemma in play for the United States. So this is my, my next big point. The US has to get its own house in order. We've been living through our own democracy, human rights and rule of law crisis in the United States. Our uh, World Justice Project Rule of Law Index shows that the United States has continued to backslide on a number of rule of law factors. And of course, President Biden recognizes this and he's been really honest in acknowledging the work that needs to be done. Uh, I just read a speech he gave at the a ceremony for creating a, a new Center for Human Rights in, in Connecticut in honor of Senator Dodd and the Dodd family. Um, senior Senator Dodd was an important figure in the Nuremberg trials. And Biden in that speech really underscored again that the U.S. must lead by the power of its example and not the example of Power, which is a nice line, but it means that the, the United States needs to take real action to promote justice and equity at home. You know, we have huge problems uh, in our political systems, and including protecting the right to vote in mainstreaming gender equity. Uh, and there are some steps in the right direction, but it's going to require action by Congress, and there's largely, you know, 
deadlock and stalemate there. Um, so I think the U.S. is in a is in a in a, is in a leadership moral deficit on this, and it can't really be a strong leader on democracy and human rights until it gets its own house in order, as I said. Um, but that also means it has to be a good citizen when it comes to participating in multilateral processes. So, you know, you have the international, the universal periodic review at the council. Um, the US has, of course, during the Trump administration was barely active on that. But another example would be the voluntary national review of the sustainable development goals. Um, the U.S. has really not stepped up to the plate on doing what it should be doing on, on the SDGs, and I'm including the, the Biden administration. Now, on, uh, on the other side, there's a small example where Secretary Blinken uh, welcomed a UN uh, HRC independent expert to look into problems of systemic racism in the U.S. So that's that's a, a step in, in the right direction, but it's gonna require a lot more to counter the skeptics, e even those among our closest friends in Europe, um, that we are digging ourselves out of the hole we've created for ourselves and that we're willing to hold ourselves uh, to international law. Um, I have some fix the membership process at, at, at the UN Human Rights Council. I don't. I already mentioned competitive slates. Um, I don't think I'll go into detail there, but in the Q and A, if there's time, we can we can go back to that. But I think the key step here is to head off Chinese attempts to you know weaken any meaningful independent scrutiny of a country's record. Also, by the way, China has been quite active in trying to undermine civil society participation, in, both at the council and in New York. So maybe I'll just say a couple words about the Summit for Democracy um, before wrapping up. As Louisa mentioned, themes of corruption, opposing authoritarianism, and promoting human rights. Uh, so U.S. needs to practice what it preaches to, to make make this a meaningful exercise. And, and the way they're going about it is to say, we know that we have our own problems, uh, but this is the power of democracies is its ability to self-correct. We're honest about our problems. We have mechanisms to address them. We have a record of change um, over two and a half centuries of uh, uh, progress on civil rights, et cetera. And, and there's, there's some truth to that, but we've also learned just how dramatically things can go backwards and how fragile our policy is. And, and I think Biden is right to put such a strong emphasis on, on this, that we have to take a humble approach, fix our problems for our home, but at the same time, we still need to be active at the international level. Um, now, the Summit for Democracy is a good kind of symbolic way of bringing democratic allies together in a more co coherent way. Uh, I, I was very involved in the launching of the Community of Democracies uh, in 2000 under Secretary Albright and Foreign Minister Goremek of Poland. Um, boy, that feels like a very different era. Uh, we know from all kinds of things that that was one of the high points of um, democratic change in the world. And now we've seen year after year after year of backsliding, including in established democracy. So we're living in a different time. And I think there's a sense of, of alarm and urgency that we need to reverse that trend. And the summit is one way to kind of reinforce that notion that Ms. Roger mentioned of, of collective um, will and action on, on this front. Uh, now, I've also argued they should not try to create a whole new multilateral mechanism on this, um, that we should use what we already have. Um, we should also be sure to engage new voices from both domestic and international civil society, um, including you know, before, during, and after the summit. And then the US needs to be very careful on who to invite um, to this summit. Uh, they're trying hard to 
engage in a series of bilateral dialogues to really get countries to commit uh, to serious action about how they're going to make changes at home uh, in order to evaluate how seriously they are committed to the whole proposition of the summit for democracy. Uh, so that's still being tested and it's taking a while. Uh, the summit is in December, just two months away, less, and they haven't issued invitations formally. So that's a concern. Then they would turn 2022 into a year of action and meet again uh, uh, late 2022. So we'll see, we'll see how that goes. But you know, I'm encouraged by, I guess my last point would be on US EU cooperation. Um, there, there is a really interesting development beyond what Ms. Roger mentioned around sanctions. Uh, the EU's you know, global human rights sanctions regime that was adopted last, late last year um, is an indication that there's a, a greater effort to use sanctions as a tool to uh, restrict the actions of those that are, are committing some egregious crimes. Uh, as you probably know, we have in the United States a law called the Global Magnitsky Act, which allows uh, the executive to issue sanctions for both um, corrupt actors and human rights abusers. And I think now Brussels and Washington are, are much closer aligned on, um, and that will make the sanctions regimes much more effective. Uh, so it remains to be seen how that plays out in practice, but I thought that was an important piece of the EU-US cooperation story to tell. And I'll pause there. Thank you very much uh, for also your introductory remarks, um, Tapicona. I think uh, we have now really laid out um, a, a great so to speak, perspective um, of uh, where the two different actors are coming from, but also what their objectives are and the challenges they face, but also how they have been gradually, if only slowly, as you mentioned, moved um, uh, towards um, uh, common, uh, so to speak, um, uh, objectives and, and um, policy lines again. We, we may see actually in our discussion as well um, how much potential there still is uh, when, so to speak, the, the uh, two are, are coming um, back together, so to speak, as an old couple. Um, but we uh, want to perhaps wait a little bit, uh, not to make too many promises here um, uh, on that end. I see that there are first questions in the chat. And um, I also um, have a couple um, uh, noted for myself, but let's um, turn to those who we see in the chat first. I um, promise that we will uh, cover um, all of the questions that we uh, receive. So uh, let us uh, quickly go and, and look into uh, what we have. Uh, there is a question for um, Mrs. Rager um, uh, by Sarah Pripitu. And, and she is asking that there that you, Mrs. Raga, mentioned several challenges the EU is facing when it comes to the promotion of human rights and democracy in the context of multilateral fora, such as the UN Human Rights Council. Would you say that one challenge the European Union faces in this regard is also the fact that its member states very often relegate it to a back? stage position when it comes to CFSP matters, including human rights promotion. If that is the case, she is asking, is there hope for the EU to play a much center stage role in the upcoming years alongside its 27 member states? Um, though resolutions are statements on a much more broader thematic geographical range of human rights issues. And um, so I think that's a really interesting question and perhaps you can so to speak, um, look into uh, that uh, question. At the same time, Ted um, Picona, there is a question for you, uh, which is more on the institutional composition, uh, let's say of the Human Rights, Human Rights Council, uh, on the United Nations Human Rights Council. 
do you view the apparent tension, Samuel von der Putte is asking, the apparent tension between the qualitatively large membership numbers and the quality of that membership uh, measured in human rights records? Should the US, now that it has rejoined lobby for reform of the UN Human Rights Council membership accession structure? Um, I think uh, that as well is a, is a really interesting uh, question. So one question perhaps for uh, Mrs. Raga now to, to also reflect a little bit on the position of the member states, um, the, 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 the position of the member states in the multilateral fora, the role of the EU, um, and perhaps Ted, you want to reflect a little bit on the US uh, perspective on, on the institutional structure of the UN Human Rights Council. I was also intrigued, if I may come in very briefly by the remark of Ted Picona on the question of backsliding and that uh, the US has to bring its house in order. Uh, the question is, of course, what are the benchmarks uh, for coming back, so to speak, uh, for really uh, achieving that goal, right? What needs to be done to repair the damage done um, and uh, what makes an actor a credible uh, human rights and democracy promotion actor? And if I may, Mrs. Varga, I would like to point that question also to you because the EU obviously has um, amongst its member states also a couple of problems currently. So to, how, to which degree is that undermining efforts of, of, of the EU on the global stage? So perhaps we can start with these three questions um, and, um, and then go into another round. I see that more questions are coming in. Okay. Um, on the question about uh, uh, from, from Sara about the role of the member states and, and the European Union multilateral setting, I, I would say that uh, I don't feel uh, uh, there is a backstage position there. In fact, uh, uh, if there is one issue uh, where uh, the work is really done hand in hand with the member states is human rights in the multilateral setting. And uh, um, that has been since uh, uh, the, uh, the stance of the European Union in uh, uh, the UN uh, uh, framework has changed uh, uh, several years ago now, and, uh, uh, and member states are looking at the European Union uh, uh, to coordinate the position and to take a leadership role. Uh, we are, uh, I think, with, with the list of uh, officials that I mentioned during my presentation on our active role on, in, uh, on the crisis of the day, so Belarus, Myanmar, uh, uh, Tigray, Ethiopia, um, and Afghanistan now, we have really seen the uh, possibility that we have to really act in a timely manner and in a concerted manner. So for me, this has been uh, uh, rather a, a, a sign of success on how we can uh, uh, work uh, uh, together to, to demonstrate the leadership uh, in the multilateral uh, setting. And um, on the question about uh, the difficulties that we have inside the European Union and how we tackle that, uh, uh, we don't deny we have difficulties. Uh, difficulties are there. Huh? Uh, on the rule of law uh, that Mr. Picon is working on is one of the issues uh, uh, that is uh, uh, really preoccupying the European Union the most. And uh, you see what is happening um, in the recent days even uh, on that. Now, uh, the rule of law mechanism uh, was our response to put our house in order, using the words that uh, Mr. Picon used, to put our house in order is to um, to have a mechanism in place, which is a yearly review of the uh, rule of law situation in the European Union. And, uh, and uh, uh, that is uh, a very uh, intense and uh, detailed uh, process. And I think that it is uh, uh, the process that will help us uh, being able to demonstrate that we are holding ourselves to the same standards that we are asking our partners uh, to respect. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the problems are still there, we have to be addressed, but the tools are there also to, uh, to make sure that, uh, that we can address the, uh, the problem. First of all, we can uh, see what the problems are and then we can address the problems. So, so this is, uh, and another element there is that uh, by no means 
uh, when we talk to our partner countries, we pretend to be perfect. We recognize that uh, we have shortcomings ourselves, and uh, and we talk about our shortcomings uh, uh, when we have a bilateral dialogue with partner countries, uh, uh, or uh, openly when we are asked about us. We we uh, recognize uh, uh, the weak points, but we are uh, also uh, committed to to address those because human rights, rule of law. Democracy are in our founding treaties, our founding values. So we need to uh, to uh, have a, a united support for what is uh, the basis of the European Union. I would also like, if you allow me, to use the fact that I I have the floor now to respond to to uh, one of the comments that Mr. Bicone made on uh, uh, China weakening uh, the body and the, the Human Rights Council and the, the Human Rights Mechanism. Uh, indeed, this is one of the preoccupations uh, and there was a lot of concerted action in the last uh, uh, sessions uh, uh, to make sure that any attempt to introduce language, uh, better life you mentioned, but win-win is another one to introduce language that uh, does not reflect uh, the uh, does not reflect the 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 the, 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 the um, foundations of of human rights does not reflect uh, the uh, the basis on which the human rights institution are are, are founded uh, is not uh, uh, does not find a way into uh, the Human Rights Council resolutions or, uh, or in New York. So this is uh, uh, something that we, to which we pay a lot of attention and we see this trend increasing. Uh, but I think that on our side, I'm saying the European Union, but not only the European Union, you mentioned the United Kingdom, but our other partners are also very attentive. We are also uh, getting uh, uh, organized to react quickly and to ensure that uh, we preserve what exists and we don't dilute uh, uh, the, uh, the basic uh, uh, norms and principles. Thank you very much. Um, Ted, please. Sure, uh, let me just answer a couple of the questions that you raised. Um, specifically on the Human Rights Council membership and what are some of the institutional fixes there. Um, you know, I mentioned before the competitive slates. I, you know, I know members of states will not like that idea. So it might be a bit, a bit unrealistic. Um, but if you're serious about reform, you need to do, you need to do something. Um, and why not lead by example? So the Western European group should put forward only competitive slates as a way to encourage others to follow that example. Um, you could raise the threshold for the votes you need to win a seat, whether it's with competition or without. Right now, it's a majority of the UNGA membership. Maybe it should be two thirds uh, so that it makes it a little harder uh, for, for certain countries that maybe are not truly committed to human rights to get elected. You know, interestingly, China, when it was last re-elected, the number of votes it received dropped significantly from, from previous times it ran for, for a seat. Another example is Russia. Um, I don't recall the exact year, but I believe the last time it, it ran or the time before, it lost. Um, it did not get enough votes. So that's another way. Um, how about making voting transparent? Right now it's secret ballots. So we don't know how many you know, backroom deals are being done to trade votes for one at, at the UN. And then a small thing, you know, countries that run for a seat are supposed to you know, pledge to uphold human rights and to cooperate with, with the council. Well, how about requiring any candidate for a seat to invite UN special rapporteurs and independent experts into the countries of kind of what they call a standing invitation, which many countries have agreed to do. I think it's about 100 now. Um, that should be a standing threshold requirement. So those are just some examples. Now, even when you have states that look better than others on paper as human rights uh, performance goes, they don't necessarily vote that way when it comes to particular 
resolutions or country situations. You know, there are a number of what I call swing states, and I've written about this quite a bit and analyzed the role of countries like Indonesia and India and Brazil and South Africa. Uh, you know, Philippines is another example that are very wedded to the non intervention principle of the UN history here and use that as, a, in my view, oftentimes an excuse to say, well, the UN Human Rights Council has no voice in this atrocity that's been committed in the country, um, and therefore we're going to abstain or we're going to vote again. So these are, at one level, nominally democratic countries or democratizing countries that have lots of commitments to human rights in their constitutions and signing of treaties, but they're not voting that way at the UN. So if the EU and the US are looking for partners to join them in a more proactive uh, human rights body, it can be very difficult to, to find the, the coalition partners for that. On, on the benchmarks for US progress, I think it's a good question. Um, and there were other questions in the, in the chat about, you know, gee, is the US ever going to be really qualified to be a, a human rights champion here? You know, we have a very obviously mixed record uh, on this front. I think probably when, when the US makes a sincere effort to get the human rights mechanisms to work well, it, it lends uh, important voice and strength in, in making things work better. It doesn't always work that way, but I think it should be given the chance to do that. Now, benchmarks for US progress. I think there are three things in particular that jump out at me. One is racism, um, the discrimination that people face in the United States. In our latest rule of law report, we see the US remains a very low score when it comes to discrimination in the civil justice system and especially low in the criminal justice system. And this is, you know, we, we see the Black Lives Matters movement and other voices, you know, calling this out. And in the United States, there is an important debate going on and some changes happening at both the national and local level to deal with this, um, this problem. Um, gender, uh, which came up before, uh, the US has definitely some work to do. That would be an important benchmark. And then voting, voting rights and protecting voting rights and, uh, you know, we have a federal system, so much of this is controlled at the state level, and we're seeing a number of states uh, roll back on voting rights. Um, they, you know, this is would require Congress to actually take action to come up with more national standards, and we are seeing that being blocked over and over again by Republicans in the Senate. So there's there's this ongoing fight. Thank you so much, um, uh, Tat Picona, and thank you again, uh, Luisa Raga, for this first um, uh, set of questions that you that you answered. But we have a, a second set of questions in the meantime uh, that I would like to to point out. Um, in fact, uh, there is one question in the chat by by um, one. Um, uh, uh, Spiridon Papados. Uh, who is asking basically um, what we can learn from the COVID-19 crisis. This is a rather general question, but it's, it's an interesting question in the sense that he basically um, argues that uh, the COVID-19 crisis has uh, basically uh, shown us that uh, there has been uh, an increase of human rights violations in the context of uh, COVID-19, that also governments have used uh, their role uh, uh, thanks to emergency orders, for example, emergency rule to actually uh, expand their sphere of influence and um, creeping into um, the, uh, so to speak, um, uh, human rights uh, of uh, their citizens. Uh, what can we learn from that episode, right? Uh, we are not over yet. Uh, we should, we should uh, also say uh, we know that uh, COVID-19 uh, isn't over yet, especially in Eastern Europe, uh, quite to the contrary. 
uh, we, we see it in other parts of the world as well, which are still struggling a lot with COVID-19, but what can, we, what can we learn and how is it, I may add to that question, how is that addressed in the current multilateral context? What is the effort to address that kind of um, uh, question of actually the fight against COVID-19 on the one hand, but also the uh, uh, preservation of human rights at the same time? How is that addressed in the multilateral context? There is another question, again, um, uh, by the same um, uh, participant, and I would like to take that on as well, because it also brings in the context of the climate, um, of the global climate agenda, and the question to which degree um, do we have to see and do we address actually the current uh, climate crisis that we are still in and that we try to tackle uh, with regards to human rights, to which degree are these two interlinked and to which degree are the US and the EU uh, bringing, so to speak, all the various uh, important tools, so to speak, um, uh, in order in order to make it happen, uh, not only to tackle the um, a global climate crisis, but also the respective human rights issues that are attached to it. Perhaps you can uh, quickly say something on that. And perhaps this is also one of the nexuses, right, uh, of the um, uh, new EU-US agenda for global change that uh, Mrs. Luisa Raga was mentioning earlier, where actually these dimensions are quite heavily addressed. Uh, there is uh, another question um, from uh, Monica Velasco, who is basically uh, asking Luisa Raga about the link between sanctions on the one hand and the EU's attempt uh, to address human rights violations through sanctioning mechanisms and the question of invoking human rights clauses. Um, to which degree are they actually linked? I, I, I read this question more as a link to which degree is actually the EU trying to follow up actually here on commitments of uh, actors to international human rights um, uh, through sanctioning um, mechanisms uh, at, uh, at, at its disposal. And what is interesting, obviously, is the new sanctioning mechanism that the EU has developed last year and already used um, uh, earlier this year also towards China. Uh, the global human rights sanction instrument. So perhaps you want to say a little bit about that. And uh, also perhaps, Ted, one more question uh, from one of the participants, uh, and that is um, the, the question that you actually already answered on the, structural, on the structural problems that the US has on the human rights um, question at home domestically. How will it ever be able to be a competitor? But uh, to, to, to be actually uh, leading by example, but uh, perhaps I can, I can add to that question um, whether you um, actually see, whether you actually see that actually a partnership, a partnership such as the one with the EU may actually be um, uh, something that the US uh, needs. Why does the e US need a partnership in human rights? Um, given its status uh, still as uh, what some would call uh, an international um, superpower that can also do things obviously very well by, it, by, by itself. Why this return to my multilateralism? Why does the US look for the ally, um, also the European Union as the ally again? What is the added value here? Um, for the US uh, under the current circumstances. So I have um, a couple of questions, as you see, for, for you, um, also on the basis of what the participants have, have asked. Um, perhaps, Luisa Raga, you want to start? Yes, thank you very much. I'll start with the, with the last one, which is, uh, uh, why are we using the sanctions uh, rather than invoking the human rights clauses in international uh, uh, agreements, and what is the difference? Um, the, the target is very different. So the, the sanctions under the new global human rights sanctions regime uh, are entities and individuals uh, uh, that have committed uh, 
uh, um, uh, grave human rights uh, uh, violation and abuses. So it is really targeting the individual or the entities, not targeting the country. The, the sanctions, uh, the clauses, uh, human rights clauses in bilateral agreements uh, are targeting uh, the violation of uh, the country. And so the effect would be for the uh, relations with the third country. So we have to look at these as two uh, complementary uh, uh, possible actions, uh, but with very different uh, uh, objectives and uh, very different effects as well. Um, now, uh, we have, uh, uh, as uh, Mr. Picone said, we have uh, the global human rights sanctions regime for uh, less than a year now. The, third, the adoption was in late 2020. We have adopted uh, the first double package of uh, designations in February, uh, March. And I think this is a great new tool that uh, we have added to our uh, already quite rich uh, uh, toolbox uh, uh, for uh, the protection and promotion of human rights. And, uh, uh, and it is uh, uh, something that uh, uh, has proven to be effective, not least uh, uh, to notice that uh, uh, the partner countries have uh, uh, really uh, responded as soon as uh, the decision was, uh, was taken. Uh, so we will uh, uh, use uh, the, the, the tools that we have at our disposal according to the situation. And in this case, uh, as I said, we need to take into account the different specificities of uh, the uh, clauses versus the sanctions regime. Um, on the uh, question about uh, the climate crisis and human rights, uh, this is in fact one of the issues that has really come at the fore in our discussions, both internally in the European Union and in the multilateral setting. Climate, addressing climate change and environmental degradation are the priorities of the current uh, um, Commission are the priorities uh, uh, in the multilateral uh, uh, arena uh, with uh, uh, the preparations for the, the upcoming, upcoming meeting in, in Glasgow for the biodiversity uh, uh, this, uh, convention as well. So these are really the key political multilateral uh, issues. And the impact on uh, of environmental degradation and climate change on human rights uh, has really uh, gained interest and traction. That can be seen uh, uh, in uh, the latest developments in the Human Rights Council. In, uh, uh, in the 47th session, the European Union led on a joint statement uh, on uh, climate change, uh, environmental degradation, and, uh, uh, and human rights. And now in the 48th session, we had two very interesting uh, resolution, uh, one uh, led by the Marshall Islands uh, uh, that the European Union uh, supported on climate change and human rights, which created a special rapporteur on climate change, which adds to the special rapporteur on environment that is already in existence uh, with a very specific mandate. And I think this is uh, the right step to do. It's a specific uh, uh, concern, it's a specific issue, and is an issue that uh, needs uh, to be given uh, due uh, attention. And, uh, and then there has been another uh, very important resolution on the right to uh, healthy environment uh, uh, adopted at the uh, Human Rights Council uh, uh, in the last session, uh, which is uh, uh, something that has been in, under discussion for some time, including in uh, uh, Strasbourg at the Council, uh, Council of Europe, uh, uh, and that has now been uh, uh, adopted as uh, a way towards the recognition of, uh, of a new right, the right of healthy environment. So this is really uh, uh, growing in importance and growing in attention uh, because there is a recognition uh, uh, now more than, than in the past that uh, an environment, uh, a degradating environment and climate change have direct effects on the uh, exercise of human rights uh, 
uh, by our population. Uh, uh, it uh, exacerbates uh, uh, inequalities. Uh, it creates migratory uh, influx. Uh, so all of that uh, builds up and, uh, and needs to be taken into account equally in the multilateral processes on biodiversity or on climate change, the human rights aspect is more and more present. Uh, if we talk about uh, now the effect uh, of uh, the still ongoing COVID-19 crisis uh, um, and, uh, and the interlinkage with, with, uh, with human rights, as the uh, participant uh, highlighted uh, the COVID uh, pandemic has, uh, uh, has resulted in greater uh, uh, differences, uh, exacerbated already existing inequalities, so the poorer have become more poor, and the, uh, uh, the more disadvantaged population uh, is more, has become more disadvantaged. Uh, we have seen a great effect uh, also on uh, gender uh, equality. We have seen uh, uh, increase in uh, um, in uh, uh, gender-based violence uh, uh, also in Europe, not only in third countries, but also in Europe. We have seen a, a sharp increase of uh, domestic violence and gender-based violence, but we have also have learned some lessons. And uh, one of the lessons uh, Professor Rabe already mentioned is uh, uh, the emergency uh, rules and how uh, careful we have to, to, to all be with the emergency rules that are uh, adopted under the disguise of the pandemic, but then uh, remain there uh, to, in fact, uh, uh, pursue different uh, objectives. And the second big lesson that we have all learned is uh, the importance of uh, digital technologies, which, of course, uh, we have seen as a, a useful tool during the pandemic because uh, uh, children could go to school, or could not go to school, but could uh, follow school uh, uh, from home uh, do, thanks to the digital technologies. Uh, uh, healthcare uh, services uh, uh, could benefit of digital services, but we have also seen the risk that digital uh, brings uh, uh, to all of us uh, uh, if it is not uh, duly respecting human rights principles. So the fact that the acting on uh, uh, maintaining the same standards uh, of human rights in the digital sphere as we are uh, maintaining in the non-digital uh, world is one of the issues that, uh, that uh, uh, needs to be pursued now uh, and uh, act activities already ongoing in the multilateral setting with, uh, uh, with working groups uh, and, uh, and resolutions as well. Uh, to deepen the cooperation and to really identify the problem and identify the actions and to work uh, closely together to ensure that we have a safe internet, we have a safe uh, digital development, and uh, also we uh, have a, a human-centric uh, uh, development of artificial intelligence. So all of these are lessons learned from uh, uh, the COVID crisis. And, uh, uh, and maybe one last word uh, uh, on that, uh, um, the attention has also um, been brought much more to uh, economic and social rights than uh, as a consequence to the uh, COVID crisis. So, to, so the right to, uh, to life, the right to, to access to uh, health, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to health services, the right to education, uh, the right to food, that has been really brought to the fore by the crisis and, uh, uh, and, and rightly so. So the balance has also shifted. A lot of lessons learned from the COVID and a lot of lessons I fear that we will still learn uh, from it because we are not over. Back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Braga, for your, for your answers. Ted uh, Picone. Well, I, I couldn't agree more with uh, what Ms. Raga said on so many of these points. Uh, maybe just to add a couple of um, elements of the research that we've been doing on the impact of COVID-19 on, on the rule of law and human rights. You know, our latest index, the data was collected entirely during the pandemic. So we can compare previous uh, pre-pandemic periods and the current one. And we do see some important 
developments that are of concern. Some of them uh, preceded the pandemic and it getting worse. Others are uh, maybe newer problems. So we're seeing a decline in constraints on executive power, so checks and balances. You mentioned the states of emergency and the lessons learned about making sure they're, they're temporary. And if they are extended, they're done in ways that are in compliance with the law, um, that parliament has a chance to weigh in as well as the public. Um, that it's not just a blank check for, for executives, so many of whom uh, manipulated or used it to uh, go after their, their opponents. And that's an obvious concern. But we did see a decline in that score in 70% of the countries that we, that we study. Um, another trend is closing civic space, uh, whether it's civic participation, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly. Uh, I think over, I think it was 82% of countries declined in at least one of those three factors. And, and a number of countries in Europe, and including the United States, also declined in all three of those factors of civic space. Now, that's not a new phenomenon. We've seen a steady trend of um, it, uh, closing um, avenues for, for civic participation. Uh, and obviously, COVID by its nature did restrict people's ability to mobilize and be um, engaged in direct um, participation or, or protesting. Um, but it is, it is a, a dangerous phenomenon. Um, a third area is a rise in discrimination. And when you think about the, the heavy disproportionate impact on people with lower incomes who are often on the front lines, of addressing COVID itself, and yet they were um, affected more deeply by, by the crisis in terms of their own rights. We, you know, Ms. Roger mentioned the domestic violence, and that is a well-documented phenomenon. Um, also, we looked at other areas of, of equal treatment along ethnic lines, race lines, migrant status, et cetera. And unfortunately, um, discrimination has increased in the majority of countries, um, in something like uh, two thirds of the countries. A, a, a fourth area, which I think is more COVID specific is delays in justice, whether it's civil justice, administrative justice, criminal justice, the, the wheels of justice have slowed down. And this obviously has uh, an effect, hopefully just temporary. And here technology played a role. Countries that have better digital systems where citizens and courts can go online are coping better with the pandemic and not surprising. Um, on climate, I would just make two additional points. One is uh, the whole concept of what we call climate justice or more broadly environmental justice because it's not always just climate. There are other environmental issues that preceded climate that have had discriminatory effects on certain populations um, that we have to to look at the climate crisis through a, a discrimination lens and make sure that vulnerable populations are, are, are addressed. Um, obviously, migration will be an increasing problem. It already, it already is, but it's going to get worse with climate crises. And that's going to really put a lot of pressure on the United States, on the EU, and most countries to come up with protocols that adhere to international human rights law and principles. Finally, the question about the US example, and, and should it go alone? Does it need the EU? I think it needs the EU more than ever. You know, it, the US is in a weaker state uh, than it was five, 10 years ago, and it's a steady decline. And therefore, it needs to, um, and it's in this competitive rivalry with, with China, which has a very different system of government. One that I think really challenges the US and EU model, more open societies. And so we've got to deal with that head on, not alone, but in partnership with, with others. There will be cases where the US will continue to go alone, like death penalty, for example. Um, you and the US are not on the same page on, on that. But I think on most issues, um, it's somewhat inevitable that the US will 
reach out to, to Europe and really try to solidify those, those ties. Thank you very much, Ted Bikun, and our time is almost up and we cannot take all the questions that are still in the chat, but there is one question which I would like to uh, put forward. Um, actually, um, Alexandra Smith is asking, um, and in a way we've discussed this before, but perhaps we can take it up for a last very brief round um, that I would like to ask you, is there a renewed sense of hope in the field of human rights work now that the US has re-engaged with the rest of the world with the new administration. And I would like to add to that question, or are we running the risk that human rights become a geostrategic instrument? Um, uh, so I would like you to, to reflect very briefly on that. Um, is there a sense of hope um, and to which degree also when we think back at the polarization that both of you have mentioned to which degree, um, are we running the risk of actually having human rights actually much more than ever becoming um, a instrument of geostrategic rivalry? Mrs. Raga, do you want to start? Yes, I'll go first, yes. I would say yes to both. It is a, 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 a renewed sense of hope, of course, um, we uh, uh, were super happy uh, that uh, the U.S. is back and is back with uh, a very similar agenda uh, to ours, and this is an agenda of uh, the promotion of human rights, uh, the, the promotion of multilateral, the, the support to multilateral institutions, uh, and uh, as well the promotion of democracy. But that, uh, as I said in my uh, first intervention, in my opening remarks, that comes with the risk, of course. And this is why I refer to a delicate balance to be found, because uh, on one side, uh, uh, we uh, uh, have a strong ally, uh, and I trust the US as a strong ally finds that uh, as a strong ally in, in the European Union. On the other side, we uh, need to be cautious uh, that human rights don't become a battleground uh, and that uh, we move all together uh, to uh, uh, find a, uh, a better place for human rights in the world and, and promote human rights in third countries. What we, so uh, avoiding uh, uh, this antagonizing situation that we have uh, uh, now, we have seen increasing, increasingly now, in the Human Rights Council is something on which we should be working together. I don't have the magic solution to that, but what I see is a really a risk that uh, human rights become a, a, a ground of, uh, of, of conflict wh whereby we should uh, uh, instead aim at having human rights as our uh, converging objective towards uh, uh, around which all partners should, uh, uh, should, uh, should rally. So uh, yes, I see that as, as a big, big, uh, big uh, uh, incentive to, to have again uh, the US on board, but we need to work closely together to avoid the risks. Thank you very much, Luisa Rager. Ted Picone, do you like to comment on that? Yeah, I'm very torn on this question because having lived through the last four years, and especially what happened in November and then January 6th, I don't think we can underestimate just how damaged the US is at home and how polarized it continues to be. And so as long as we're that polarized and dysfunctional, uh, we won't be able to really exert a serious positive leadership. That said, we got through the crisis and so far and we have a new president and a new Congress and doing a lot of good, important things. And so that does give us all hope, it should. And I've talked to people who are really quite strong critics of the US who say, we need the US back. You know, We need a positive, proactive US back in the UN human rights system and on democracy, et cetera. So when I hear that, I'm encouraged. You know, There is um, a sense that even people who see all the faults of the US uh, want uh, this kind of administration to do the right thing. Um, by the way, until we get some accountability for what happened on January 6th, we're gonna remain uh, in a weak position. Um, on the other point, 
uh, about politicization of, of human rights, you know, I would, it, 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 it is a political topic. The Human Rights Council is a political body. Inevitably, there'll be great battles over what all this means. But nonetheless, at, a, at another level, and tracking this over many years, I've seen how the council has taken a number of steps to strengthen different mechanisms to act on a variety of crises uh, as best it can. I mean, the tools are fairly weak. But, uh, you know, adopting a resolution is not directly going to help victims on the ground. But I think the independence of its mechanisms, whether it's special rapporteurs or um, commissions of inquiry uh, that can build up the evidence case, build up the normative practice, this is what gives the, the human rights system real credibility, in my view. And I think we need to continue to protect those key elements to avoid the politicization. On this very positive note, I would like to uh, end the um, panel debate. Um, thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Louisa Rager and uh, Mr. Ted Picona for being with us tonight. Um, I think we've learned a lot. I learned a lot and um, the debate has been fascinating. I think there is a lot to be expected from uh, the old couple, as I said before, and I hope uh, that it's all for the best of human rights and uh, for the um, actually human rights implementation, right? Because we all know that this is the most important part to actually bring human rights to the people um, who otherwise are actually uh, those who remain the most vulnerable. So thank you very much for your contribution to the ongoing debate. Thank you for everybody for tuning in. I wish you a great evening and um, I hope to see you uh, also physically back very soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>